Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be talking about interpreting prophecy in our continuing series on hermeneutics. Some characteristics of biblical prophecy. First of all, biblical prophecy always serves a specific purpose. It's not merely written so that you can uh, lay out a really neat time chart of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, that's not its purpose. Uh, it always has a specific purpose. Sometimes it serves as a warning. Uh, don't do this or else this could happen. Uh, sometimes it's written to give comfort in the in the midst of a difficult situation, uh, comfort for the future. Uh, sometimes it's given to build faith where you can hear the prophecy and then see the fulfillment after the fact but usually when it's that, um, there's there's some either warning or comfort that comes with it. Biblical prophecy is historically relevant to the time of the writing. That is, when, when whoever writes it and whoever receives it, remember, anytime you have something written in the Bible, there's the writer and there's the recipient of the writing, uh, the first reader, and it would somehow be relevant to them. That doesn't mean it's being necessarily fulfilled in their day, but they need to hear this. They need to hear it, maybe for that warning, maybe for that comfort, maybe so that their faith will grow in the process, but it's always historically relevant to the time of the writing, and we have to ask the question, just like we would ask this of any genre in the Bible when we're trying to interpret any particular passage, we ask, why is this written, and how would the original readers understand it? How would the original writer understand it? Although, let me just say, sometimes in prophecy, (laughs) I think that the writers, there were occasions where they wrote more than they realized. They still had a purpose. But sometimes, sometimes I don't know that they, they understood the full fulfillment of the very words that they were writing. I, and I think uh, the reason for that is because they were guided by the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, they understood what they were writing, but sometimes there's more meaning than they realized. Biblical prophecy sometimes contains multiple fulfillments. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a prophecy that's fulfilled o- over a period of time, um, or sometimes there's actually different ways in which it is fulfilled. Uh, let me use this illustration. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, visit. Actually, I've done it a few times. But the first time I visited my older brother, he lives in Germany, uh, just outside of uh, Munich. And it snowed that night. And, and the next day, it had, the snow had driven all the smog out of the air. And you could look to the south. And in the distance, you could see the Alps, just this chain of mountains. And it just looks like solid, jagged peaks. And so we hopped in a car and we drove down to the mountains. And once we got there, you could see, wait a minute, uh, there's sometimes valleys in between the mountains that you couldn't see from far away. In fact, you really couldn't see the valleys in between until you got into the mountains themselves. And in the same way, sometimes when you have the prophet who's writing, he will just look and see the mountains and he'll, he'll describe these these events, these prophecies, and until you get into the mountains, until it begins to be fulfilled, you can't necessarily see that there is a valley in between. And time gaps are not always indicated. Sometimes they can be the valleys. Um, And so, for example, you look at a prophecy of the Messiah that's found in the Old Testament. And once you see the fulfillment of it in Jesus in the New Testament, you realize, well, he fulfilled parts of this, but other parts are still in the future. You couldn't get that. They didn't realize that. You couldn't get that until you get past the the first peak of fulfillment, if I can call it that. Uh, And you can see, wait a minute, uh, now I see more of the pattern. I see uh, how this prophecy had uh, a number of fulfillments. It had uh, a number of different successive ways in which it came to be. So those can be either two different fulfillments, or sometimes they can be uh, one fulfillment, but but it's scattered uh, and it's, it's divided by time in the middle. Next, we want to point out that biblical prophecy is sometimes conditional. Now, let me change that. (laughs) Biblical prophecy is often conditional. You see, there are times when the conditions are mentioned. For example, uh, Isaiah chapter 1 says, if you do this, uh, then I will accomplish this. Um, If you obey me, then I will pour out blessings upon you. If you disobey me, these bad things are going to happen. But, But very oftentimes, there are not conditional conditions mentioned where they might be 
obviously assumed, or to our eye, not necessarily even there. So that there are these unnamed conditions. Uh, The classical example is in the book of Job. Uh, I'm sorry, the book of Jonah, where Jonah goes into Nineveh, and he says 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, he doesn't say someday in the future it will be destroyed. He says 40 days, and Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And then you uh, see Noah 40 days later. He's waiting for the destruction to come. What has happened in the interim is that the king and the people of the city of Nineveh have repented, and so God relents, and he doesn't destroy the city. So that it was a conditional prophecy but the condition was never stated. And that that leads me to suggest that perhaps a lot more of the Bible, a lot more of the biblical prophecies than we ever realized might be conditional, and yet that condition is either assumed or it's not stated, and we might not even realize that it's conditional. You only find out about that after the fact. And so conditional prophecy, I think, is or biblical prophecy is often, maybe a lot more than we realize, where it's often conditional. And, and uh, when we see that, we're going, going to say that might change uh, a large part of the way we view prophecy. Cultural terminology may be used. There's a passage in, remember the seals in Revelation chapter 6, and, and there's a, uh, uh, it's talking about the price of wheat, uh, how much wheat is sold for a denarius, and, and how much, is, uh, how much the, is the price of barley and things like that. We don't think about things like that today, but that was a way of describing in that day the process of what we might call inflation. And so there's terminology that's used. It doesn't really affect us today. You know, uh, I don't really think about the, the price of wheat and the price of, of barley. But inflation certainly eats into my wallet. And so it's using those sorts of terms that would be understandable to the readers of that day, even if, if it goes over our head. Prophetic fulfillments can be literal, figurative, or spiritual. Some examples, for example, of a a literal fulfillment, Ezekiel chapter 26 talks about uh, the city of Tyre. There was actually a city to the north of Israel called Tyre, uh, and it gives a number of prophecies how this uh, city would be destroyed, first by Nebuchadnezzar, and then it talks about how others would come. And it says in the prophecy that that the city of Tyre would be thrown into the sea. Now, if I were reading that originally, I, I might have thought, well, maybe that's sort of figurative language or some sort of spiritual language. But actually, in that case, it happened very literally. We're 150 years after Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Alexander the Great came along. And he, in order to capture the island part of the city of Tyre, he took all of the ruins from the mainland and literally, literally threw them into the sea uh, to build up a, a giant causeway to take him out to the island. Or think of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 that speaks about the Messiah coming humble, coming into Jerusalem humble, and riding upon a donkey. And sure enough, Matthew chapter 21, verse 5 actually quotes the prophecy as Jesus is described going into Jerusalem that way. Literal fulfillments. But sometimes there are figurative fulfillments. Uh, Again, a classic example would be John chapter 2, verse 19, where Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he stands in the temple, and he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, it, because he was standing there, because of, of where the prophecy was spoken, you would have thought he was speaking about the literal temple. Uh, fortunately, in the Gospel of John, John in the next verse goes on to explain, but Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. It was figurative language. It wasn't, he wasn't speaking of the physical temple, even though that's where he was. Uh, or Psalm 118 and verse 22 that uh, speak about the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That passage is quoted several times in in 1 Peter and also in Acts chapter 4 uh, to speak of Jesus, where he is the stone that the builders rejected. That's figurative language. He's not a literal rock, but he is the 
that that figure, he is the stone that the builders rejected. And then there's also spiritual language. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, uh, speak about the new covenant. And uh, certainly, uh, it, in fact, it's talked about a, a new covenant with, with Israel and with Judah. And you think, well, that's, that can only take place if there's an, uh, a literal physical Israel or a literal physical Judah standing there. But Hebrews chapter 8 points out, no, that's actually something into which believers today have entered into. And uh, you understand that because you've probably been in your church where you have partaken of the the signs of the, that new covenant, the, uh, the bread and the wine. These are, uh, remember how Jesus said, uh, this is the blood of the new covenant. Um, he was connecting that to the Lord's Supper, and we ought to as well. Or Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, that talk about how God will raise up this, the, the fallen tabernacle of David. And you say, well, what is that? David's going to have a tabernacle that, that fell down and is going to be picked up again? No. Um, in Acts chapter 15, that passage is quoted by James, James the Lord's brother, to say that points to Jesus. That was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And, and because of that, if you go on to read the rest of the Amos chapter 9 passage, it talks about how he's going to call the, the, the nations. And James says, see, because he's going to call the nations, we can allow Gentiles Gentiles to come into the church. And that was, believe me, that was a revolutionary idea in his day. Next, we determine the historical background of the prophet and the prophecy. We do the same thing with any any genre of biblical literature, whether it's uh, narrative, uh, anything that's written. Uh, The same holds true uh, with prophecy. You know, why is he writing this? Uh, What's going on? What brought the prophecy about? Determine the full meaning and significance of all of the proper names, the events, the geographical references, references to customs, to material culture, all of these these things, uh, they form the background, again, of any genre. But oftentimes names can be significant. Sometimes events can be significant. Certain uh, places can have events associated with them. I think of the book of Revelation, chapter 16, that that speak of a place called Har Megiddo. We would say Armageddon, um, and it's a, it's a Hebrew term. You, you ask, what does that mean? Uh, but especially you ask, what had taken place there uh, and what associations were already present with that location? It's a little bit like asking somebody who's maybe from the state of Texas. Uh, you remember the Alamo and you say, well, <laughs> what on earth does that refer to? Any, anyone from Texas is going to understand that historical reference because it's a, a, f- a famous place name and something happened there. Or if I say to somebody from France uh, uh, and I say something about meeting your Waterloo, uh, Waterloo was a, a famous battle that Napoleon Bonaparte uh, was involved, when it w- involved with. It was his defeat. And and someone from France might know that, and it has special significance to them. If you're not from France or you don't know your, your history of that particular era, then it, the term is meaningless to you. Uh, so those things have meaning. Uh, 
if the you ask if the prophecy is predictive in nature, and if it is, then go on to determine uh, has it been fulfilled or unfulfilled. That's not always that easy. Uh, to understand. P- people sometimes have missed the fact because they don't know uh, their their ancient history or maybe their biblical history as well as they should. Um, a prophecy may have had a fulfillment. Uh, it may have been completely fulfilled, uh, and uh, that fulfillment is missed by the reader because he's not familiar with uh, the history of the uh, that part of the world. Uh, so ask if it's, if it's fulfilled or unfulfilled. Is it local or or temporal, in other words, uh, was it was it a prophecy that was going to be fulfilled in a very specific area, or was it something that was perhaps global? Was it something that had a specific fulfillment in time, or was it going to be something that had an eternal fulfillment? Uh, is it conditional or unconditional? And remember, conditions are not always stated. Uh, sometimes they're not even hinted at. Sometimes it's not clear at all that the prophecy is conditional. Next, we want to determine whether the fulfillment might be spiritual or physical, or frankly, sometimes a combination of both. Uh, It might not be a decision between one or the other. Uh, It indeed might be a combination of of, of physical and spiritual and and figurative fulfillments. Uh, Look for explanations by the author. There are times where, if you read just a little bit further, I think of uh, Zechariah, where there's a vision of four horsemen. Uh, And you say, four horsemen, aren't you talking about Revelation chapter 6? No, when you see it in Revelation chapter 6, you're supposed to say, oh, I remember what that is. That's something that was mentioned back in the book of Zechariah. And when you see it in Zechariah, you read a little further, and there's an explanation. You know, what does this vision mean? And Zechariah is told. So you actually have to read the passage, the context of the passage, to find out uh, what it means there. Uh, The same thing happens in Revelation chapter 1, where John has this vision of a lampstand. And you read a little further, and he's told what the lampstand represents. You just have to read the context to look for explanations by the author. Determine if the same theme or concept is treated elsewhere, and then compare the passages. Sometimes you have, um, I think, for example, of Daniel chapter 7 that has uh, these uh, visions of beasts that are coming up out of the sea. And then Daniel chapter 8 has a different vision. There's a goat and, and some other things happen, but you find out that the the prophecies overlap, and they're speaking of the same general topic, and one helps you understand the other. And so you look for those patterns. Now, make sure they really fit together, uh, not just that it's something imagined as your first reading, uh, but make sure that they they really fit together, and then one will help you interpret the other. Uh, Was there something the author would have had in mind. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's actually reading uh, the, uh, I'm, I don't know if it was a scroll or if he's doing this from memory, but he's contemplating the prophecy of Jeremiah that had been written a few generations earlier. They had been sort of contemporaries, uh, but Dan- Daniel was probably a little bit younger, and, and he's looking at Jeremiah's prophecy, and he's trying to figure that out, and uh, an angel shows up and gives him a, a further explanation of that. So, is there something that the author would have in mind? Maybe some portion of earlier scripture. Now, Daniel couldn't be thinking about uh, the God, the Gospel of Matthew that hadn't been written yet. It has to have been earlier than the author. But was there something that had already been revealed that he would be aware of? And finally, I think we can say, look for Jesus in every prophecy. I'm not saying he's always there but he's probably there a lot more than we realize. I think of my friend Warren Gage, who likes to say, whenever you see a a reference in the Old Testament to the third day, look for a picture. It might not be a a prophecy particularly, but it might be a type or a picture. Look for Jesus and see if you can see him there, and you won't often go wrong. 